a very good evening to one and all. Thank you for coming and hope you have a wonderful evening ahead. Uh, we have with us best-selling author, an ace political communication uh, expert, Srimati Priyam Gandhi Modi ji. Uh, she is a very well accomplished author and this is her fourth book uh, we are having been, that is being launched here. Uh, congratulations, Madam, on your fourth book. Uh, the inspiration had come from Honorable Prime Minister Modiji's address in the winter session in Kathori 2022 when he raised a very pertinent question, what if there was no Congress in India? A thought, a, a perhaps a sentiment echoed by none other than Mahatma Gandhiji who wrote a letter himself in 1948, uh, just uh, three days before his assassination where he uh, suggested that the Congress be disbanded. Uh, because his premise being Congress in the current form had outlived its use and purpose. The author extensively deals with clarity on the origin of the Congress party in India and how it was kept alive by a few congressmen with vested interests and proximity to the British Raj. The book has about 280 pages out of which 20 pages, just 20 pages don't have uh, references. Meaning 93% of the book has got uh, three to four references each page has got to historical facts. And uh, once again, uh, congratulations on the way you have put in, uh, they written the book, ma'am, in a very, very lucid manner. And it's a very, very easy read and uh, unput downable to say the least. Thank you, thank you. I'm very humbly accepting your very kind words. I really enjoyed reading the book. Thank you I so much. it in three to four days. This is music to an author's ears. <laughs> I shall start this uh, interaction by asking some interesting questions and I am uh, certain that all of you would be amused uh, by the fa fascinating observations and stunning revelations. Uh, could you please elaborate the great Congress blunder of 1939 and how Patel was repeatedly sidelined? So several times the choice for the Congress party leadership uh, and senior members repeatedly was said that <coughs> Sardar Patel was truly the man who ran the party. He collected the funds, he distributed the funds, he knew how to get somebody elected from where. So he knew which businessman to go to, when to go to. Sardar Patel was the man who did it all. Unfortunately, he was uh, a true Gandhian. And uh, every time he wanted to uh, head the Congress, Gandhiji would either say that, okay, I'll support you and then withdraw the support at the very end or, uh, you know, he would call him and he would say, is bar Panditji ko banjane dije, agi bar aap bani. So unfortunately, you know, his the fact that he was principled and the fact that he was a Gandhian was, I think, uh, you know, abused uh, and uh, in favor of uh, Pandit Nehru. It was done over three times. Three months. times. And he secured all of the times, all of the times he secured more votes than Nehru. Yes, yes. Oh, yes, yes. He secured more votes than Nehru. And, had to be and he had to give it up to yes. Pandit In fact, there was this one time where Gandhiji himself was contested and he transferred his votes to Pandit Ji. Uh, so, it, it was absolute uh, injustice, but of, the, of course the laws for dynasts work uh, differently. <laughs> also tell about the uh, role of revolutionaries within the Congress party in achieving success in the freedom movement and the events that unfolded thereafter. Second World War, in my view, is a result of unintended consequences. Yes, yes. So, um, all right. So. Mahatma Gandhi was also the chief recruiting officer for the British to recruit Indians for the Imperial Army to fight the war for them. Mahatma Gandhi was willing and had committed to the voice Viceroy then that he would support in recruiting Indians. Okay. Now at that point, everybody who wanted to join the freedom struggle inherently joined the Congress. Um, now there were two sections of the Congress. There was this Pandit Nehru slash Mahatma Gandhi section and then there was this Subhash Chandra Bose uh, revolutionary section who believed that non-violence is not going to get us freedom. More so like what uh, Shri Krishna believes, you know, that you have to fight the war. 
right? You have to fight, fight the war of dharma. If you just give up your weapons and expect to win, that's not going to happen. So the revolutionary section led by Bose, the Lal Pal, Lal Pal Pal, you know, inspired by Swami Vivekananda, uh, inspired by teachings of uh, and lives of Chhatrapati uh, Shivaji Maharaj. You know, it is this section that really got down to the streets and fought violently against the British. This is, this is what really scared the British. Now, let's remember that in the Second World War, uh, Panditji said, okay, we will not let you recruit any more Indians and against this, we will carry out our non-violent, civil disobedient, uh, disobedience movement. Britishers said, sabko jail mein down. So they picked up all the senior leaders of the Congress the Nehruvian leaders and jailed them. Now what this did was that the only people who remained out of jail were the revolutionaries. So the civil disobedience movement which was supposed to be a non-violent movement became a violent movement. To stop that violence, Gandhiji had to fast and say that this movement which I have only created but has become violent, now I am going to fast so you stop this violence. But that scared the British because they realize that if this news spreads to the US or the other parts of the world that they are not able to control their colony, it's going to have a very severe reputational impact. And that's when they really started thinking about an exit and protecting their strategic interests if they have to make an exit. Very interesting. Well, what about the monumental mistake of Nehru in 1946? handling of the partition and also playing into the hands of Jinnah who was very very wily. So um, my belief about partition is that we have given away too much of our land and it was done too hurriedly. We could have really settled for giving a matchbox sized Pakistan. There are records where Jinnah has said that he is willing to accept even a matchbox sized Pakistan. Okay? A, we did not negotiate for that. B, as soon as Mountbatten came, the last Viceroy and first Governor General of Independent India, the moment he came, the first meeting he had was with Pandit Nehru. It was a three hour meeting. In those three hours, Pandit Nehru was fully smitten by the Mountbatten family. But on the other hand, Mountbatten got to know that Pandit Ji, these are the words that Mountbatten has used, that Pandit Nehru is gossipy and malicious about his colleagues. This gossip that he shared about his Congress colleagues was used by the British, was used by Mountbatten to convince the other Congress leaders, you know, and to tweak their you know, judgments about uh, accepting partition or accepting certain decisions about Kashmir. So, that is one. Second takeaway that Mountbatten had from that first meeting with Pandit Nehru was that uh, he convinced Pandit Nehru that Mahatma Gandhi is an unrealistic politician and that he must be kept away from all uh, freedom movement and independence and partition talks if they had to go somewhere. Nehru, completely convinced, pushed Mahatma Gandhi on the sidelines. They went to Shimla, they decided the full partition plan and uh, finally, like a rubber stamp, Mahatma Gandhi came to meet Mountbatten and uh, very interestingly, when he came to meet Mountbatten to give his consent for partition, he came in, in his loincloth, he wrote on a piece of paper, Aaj mera mon rat hai, lekin aap bhi nahi chaoge ke aaj main kuch bhul. So he knew that he was pushed to the side by Panditji, but I mean he didn't really know what else to do at that point in time. Very sad how we have been compromised and very well you have brought out uh, how the a candidate you brought about how the relationship which Mountbatten had with, sorry, Nehru had with the Mountbatten's and the profound impact that we have seen today. So interestingly, it's not just, it was an entire axis. So even Mountbatten's uh, main officer, even he was a regular at the Nehru household breakfast table. Campbell. Yes. 
he formed a close friendship with Indira. So he would convince Indira, Mrs. Mountbatten would convince Nehru, and the women would keep playing in his mind. You see, there was an entire axis that was created. Very sad. Uh, post partition or midway through the partition, the patriotic role of Patel, however uh, more he might have been sidelined, he took a very nationalistic view, impartial view, and went about doing his karmic duty assigned to him. Uh, what about the role of Patel in uh, integrating the princely states? And uh, in the book, there, are, there is a very nice story on the, how the king of Junagadh uh, took off in his plane with the dogs and all, 150 dogs and all that. He left his wife and took Wife and took the dogs. Yeah. <laughs> So highlight on the how Kashmir was because there are so many layers to the Kashmir. Uh, uh. Yeah. So before before I start this, let us be clear that Pandit Ji had written in letters to then imperial leaders that he was and as early as 1946 actually that according to him and this was written to Cripps by Nehru in 1946 that according to him independence would mean that this land would be divided into several parts, balkanized. One part would be India, one part would be Pakistan. The bigger princely states would run as independent nations like Kashmir, Hyderabad, etc. And smaller princely states would make clusters and those clusters would become other independent nations. So this full Bharat Bhumi would become completely balkanized into multiple nations and this is the proposal that Panditji gave to Crips. That this is how I propose you should give us independence. So this is where his thinking and was. And he was very comfortable in parting away. Absolutely. See there are territories that we should have needed. Today the Congress party, for decades they have continued this narrative that Panditji was a great statesman and there is no other statesman like him born into this land. Now let us understand the reality of what happened in 1947. Northwest Frontier Province was a Congress province. Yes. Okay, very very strategic province. It gave, gives us give, gives India access to the very important uh, you know Middle Asia little bit to the Middle East, very, very important, uh, you know, parts to Afghanistan, very, very important province. There were Congress governments, I mean, there was minority population, there was a Congress government. If the rules had been followed, then elected representatives, which were Congress representatives, they would have easily elected and said, we, would, we want to join the Indian Union. But just so that the British could protect their strategic interests, and get Northwest Frontier Province for Pakistan, Nehru and Mahatma Gandhi changed the rule and introduced the plebiscite. First time plebiscite was introduced over there. And they gave away, we gave away North, Northwest Frontier Province on a platter without even contesting to Pakistan. Absolutely. Uh, well, one thing where I have to give a big round of applause to you is uh, back and forth in chronology. <coughs> Uh, 1939, 46, so many years and dates are there, and you have not confused the reader anywhere about the events. But I want to go back on Sardar Patel actually. There's another story that I want to uh, you know, say about Sardar Patel. And this is very interesting. Only a little bit of that is there in the book. Um, so, when Kashmir accession was delayed, and once again, because Nehru had put conditions that you free them, uh, free Sheikh Abdullah, and only then will I accept Haraja uh, Hari Singh's accession and all of that, that delayed accession. The British had prepared the tribals to invade. Yes. Okay, and take over the land in Kashmir. Sardar Patel got a whiff of that. Ki ye log ne ye now what Sardar Patel did is through Kufia letters, spoke to the Maharaja of Patiala, Yadavindra Singh. Okay? Because after partition, the main railway lines went to Pakistan, the main roads went to Pakistan. The only thing that would connect Kashmir to Indian land was this very rough road through Patiala or this one Srinagar 
airstrip that the Maharaja used to use for his personal use. So Sardar Patel realized that if the Kabbalis come, they will come for the airstrip because that is the only way we can send our defense, uh, you know, army, supplies, etc. So he sent letters to the Maharaja of Patel. You send guns. And you send men with guns in supply trucks before it starts snowing to protect the airstrip and the airfield, the Srinagar airfield. So Yadavendra Singh sent some men and sent lots of guns in, in supply uh, ration trucks through that rough road. In fact, when they reached Kashmir, uh, Maharaja Hari Singh said to the men, you guys can't go back, you all also stay here and fight. Yes. And he inducted them into his army to fight for them. Now this is true patriotism and this is what Sardar Patel orchestrated. So, uh, what do you have to say about the Jiljit region or the British had maybe the Jiljit agency yes. and the strategic importance and uh, <coughs> strategic importance to the British and how uh, how and why they wanted Jiljit to be partitioned and for how the British perpetrated the Kashmir issue and it has been a festering wound in the Indian history until Modi ji revoked the Article 370. Right. So, the uh, as you know, in the Second World War, the whole world was in the race for the atom bomb. It was a nuclear race. Everybody was in the race for the atom bomb. The uranium mining was happening at Sinkhank, which borders your Gilgit Baltistan border, okay, with uh, Sinkhank in now, there was the plane where the Soviets were testing their atom bombs. What the British had done is they had set up three monitoring stations in that area. Okay? These stations would record the frequency and the acoustic uh, um, uh, you know, activities and they would every day, there was a daily output from the stations going to US and UK governments. So, it was extremely crucial for the, for the UK to keep that region under their control even if they gave India independence. See now this is what I mean that we could have just restricted Jinnah to a matchbox size Pakistan. If we were truly statesmen, we could have negotiated a deal with the uh, British that okay you keep the Gilgit Pakistan area, that is, strategic, that is of strategic importance for you, okay you keep it on a long lease like Hong Kong, Taiwan etc. But in return, you limit Pakistan to a very, very tiny uh, area. Unfortunately, our leaders did not understand that type of geopolitics at that time. And we had no clue until many, many years later that there were these nuclear stations in Pakistan. Completely naive and... Uh, yes. A bull in a china shop is a befitting place as, as it were. The Indochina border has been the longest border under dispute in the world. Could you elaborate on the inept foreign policy of, and how the US administration was mishandled by Mr. Nehru? Yes, I, a little bit of what Professor just said, that non-alignment was a complete sham. It did not work. And the 1962 war with China really sort of proves it. So first of all, we made these little stands and we call them forward posts. They were not attached to main roads that supplies could get to them in time or nothing. We just said that we have these forward posts but we were not prepared. We believe that we should not fund supplies for our armies, we should not uh, army, we should not buy enough weapons etc. because we believe in this ahimsa non-violence will never fight wars. You know we had that, uh, that was our thinking. Okay. Then China started to do these incursions, you know, the small, 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 small uh, skirmishes. They started to build roads through Aksai Chen. And that's when we realized we have to fight. So then again, we made mistakes in our forward policy and we instigated them and that war happened. It was so bad, we were so ill-prepared that within a few days, China was about to take over not just uh, Aksai Chen, but also our entire Northeast starting from the Siliguri corridor. And there is proof of this. There is a day where Panditji has written two letters to President Kennedy. In the morning, he says to President Kennedy, who was the then US President, 
then please send us American fighter jets if you we really really need them uh, to control uh, China behaving like this etc. On the same day in the evening, he was so desperate. The situation became so bad in a matter of seven eight hours. He wrote another desperate letter to President Kennedy saying. Your jets, American jets, don't even have to fight like our allies. They have to fight like our jets. They have to fight on our behalf. And if they don't immediately start fighting on our behalf, we will lose the entire northeast to China. Then China ne ham pe daya khaya or ceasefire announced kiya. Okay, and in exchange for that ceasefire, in exchange for them letting us keep that northeast. They took away so much of Afghanistan. There is a map in my book that shows exactly how much land the Congress Party has given away from Jammu and Kashmir. We have given away over 45% of our land from Jammu and Kashmir to either China or Pakistan. How can the Congress ask the government today, "Kitna land tumne de diya hai? Tumne kitna land diya hai?" For a very long time, Nehru was in denial when asked in the parliament about Aksai Chin until 1962 happened. And uh, at some point also, Pakistan took a very good diplomatic lead with the Americans, American administration. And to the extent I think you mentioned, the American president had a pact with the Pakistanis that without their consent, they would not sell weapons to India. Yes. Now over to some economics and how Nehruvian socialist economics. That took us down the dwindling spiral. And what do you have to say about this? So, like Professor was also saying, see, there was a time in 1945 that businessmen came together and they proposed a potential economic structure. Nehru didn't want to talk about it, but businessmen came together and said, "We think that this is how our economy should be after should run after independence." This is called the Bombay Plan, which is the details of which are there uh, in my book. Unfortunately. Pandit Ji was so smitten by the Soviets that he just wanted to replicate what we were doing in India. What he did not realize is that everything we had was stolen. We had to build the country from ground up. We didn't have enough resources to distribute equally. We had to build those resources first. Even then, we saw some type of economic growth in his tenure. But what happened in Indira Ji's tenure is uh, we can't. It is horrible. She ran and she ran the license raj system like an extortion racket. So basically, every industry, every sector would have so many licenses and so many renewals, and the renewals would have to be done so often to import, to manufacture, to distribute, to distribute to one state, to hire these many men. There were licenses required for everything. Then what happened? I'll give you an example. Say for example, there is a textile association. Unke hi log ja ke rumor felayenge, aap ye sector mein teen nai licenses introduce karenge. Now that association would panic. They would come saying, hume appointment de do, hume appointment de do. Fir ruka ruka ke they would give, they would come to Delhi and be granted an appointment with Sanjay ji. And after that, uh, they would say, do one thing, sir. Please don't introduce these licenses. Uski samne ye cash le lijiye hamare paas. And they would bring suitcases and suitcases of cash in exchange for the government to not introduce those licenses. So they ran it like an extortion racket. Very unfortunate. You know, there is this uh, episode when Sanjay Gandhi died. B K Nehru. Asked Rajiv Gandhi that uh, the money that Sanjay had collected, where is it? So Rajiv Gandhi says, Congress ke almariyon mein se sirf 20 lakh rupee mile hai. So Pekin Eru asks him, kitne hone chahiye? So Rajiv says, crores and uncounted crores. So that excuse that they are collecting money for the party is clearly debunked. Because the money didn't go to the party; it went in their personal pockets, in the family's pockets. That is exactly what I've been saying. The family has exploited the resources of the country and taken it away. In your book, you have mentioned in 1955, around that time, a mill in Bombay or Coimbatore had to have 
577 uh, licenses to, to run, to function. Yeah. 577, I don't know how many. And, and they have to keep renewing it, something it, or the uh, other uh, uh, every now and then. Ma'am, now over. Uh, what, in your opinion, was Mrs. Gandhi's license raj? Was it an offshoot of Nehru <laughs> socialism or was it more draconian? It was definitely more draconian. Definitely more draconian. The inflation at her time stood at 34.5%. 34.5% was inflation during Indira Gandhi's time. And uh, today, even in the UPA second term, it was double digits. So they have not, I mean, it's clearly. It's very clear that they don't know how to manage the economy. In 91 also, when they opened up the economy, they did so as against the funds that they were taking from IMF and World Bank. The IMF and World Bank forced us to open up our economy. Dr. Manmohan Singh and P.V. Narasimha Rao thinking that we have to open up our economy. We were made to open up our economy. And, and in exchange for that, there is some, there is, I've written about this in the book also, that uh, Dr. Manmohan Singh got reprimanded in the party meeting for open up, uh, opening it up and moving, ahead, uh, moving away from the party's uh, socialist stand. And we all know how uh, Narasimha Rao ji was treated after his death. His body was not allowed to come inside the Congress headquarters. Uh, Prana Mukherjee kept telling Sonia ji that please Ane teacher, the body is outside waiting for her not, but she never knocked it. Rightfully today, uh, Honorable Prime Minister has awarded Parak Rasna to you. Thank you, Nasimha. Uh, any references to the Congress party is incomplete without the references to the grand scams that they have been involved. And also the pseudo-secularism which they practice rigorously. One of an estimate that you have given in your book, the amount or, or the uh, amount of money that has been looted over the years by the grand old party amounts to 4,80,000 crores or 58 billion US dollars. So, yes. So the UPA era. So I think this is what happened. You know, people ask what happened in 2014. And I always say that, that there comes a time for a civilization. जब अधर्म इतना बढ़ जाता है, चोरी इतनी बढ़ जाती है, you know, and all that corruption money was, you know, getting diverted into terrorism. It was getting diverted into anti-national activities. You know, there was all of that flow. If you, if you saw the flow of that illegal money, it, it was getting diverted to all of that. Our children were dying, our parents were dying, our people were dying. You know, so that's when I think the civilization woke up. And I think that is why uh, Bharatiyas will never bring Congress back to power again. That is why. Never. Wonderful, ma'am. India that is Bharat as we speak today is under the able leadership of Sri Narendra Modi ji has tra truly transformed in the last nine years with over 109 million toilets being built and we have declared ourselves but, and also by the international bodies as open defecation free country. Not only that, uh, Prime Minister when he came to power, he uh, brought in the revolutionary, I mean, uh, finan true financial inclusion, Jan Dan Yojana. He opened 51.14 as we speak, 51.14 bank accounts, broad bank accounts, banking the unbanked people. And that helped proper governance delivery during, uh, sorry, um, subsidy delivery and also cash uh, direct benefit transfers and such a foresight it really worked during the COVID uh, thing and your third book, uh, the previous to No Congress, your third book, Nation to Protect, covers very well the wonderful actions of Modi government during the COVID crisis, the effective COVID handling and uh, many congratulations to you on that, man. I look forward to do an online session with you on this book. And uh, we have with us today Prime Minister Modi ji leading us. All comes to show that with true political will and with the right intent and honesty, anything is truly possible and we can become a superpower and we are in the making. 
Thank you so much. I thoroughly enjoyed reading your book and wonderful session. Over to you to address the gathering much in detail on the book. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much.